Hi, I'm going to introduce Dr. Just Justin Richardson from UMass, who's going to give us a talk about some research he's been doing in the Thames watershed. So with that, I turn it over to you, Justin. Great, thanks. It's uh, great to be here and uh, to present to people who, uh, you know, is near and dear here in Western Massachusetts. Thames is, uh, you know, an afterthought. So it's nice to be uh, working with people who actually live and work in the area. So the title of today's talk is Understanding Spatial and Temporal Transport of Toxic Metals and Phosphorus in Soil, Sediments, and Waters Across the Thames River Watershed. This is work that um, I initiated. Uh, I'll give the justification why I chose the Thames in a little bit, but I initiated in 2018 and continued into 2020 when most things shut down. Uh, and then also the student undergrad who is doing a lot of the field work, Mark Butler, graduated. So there's two reasons why I kind of shut down. Um, but I also had some great collaborators, uh, Brian Yellen, who's in my department of geosciences here at UMass Amherst, also Dr. Oyinka Oyuemi at Eastern Connecticut State University, then also had some great help from uh, Dr. Will Weeman at the University of Connecticut and the Department of Earth Sciences. Great. So who am I? Well, I should probably say who I am. Unlike most of you, I've never lived in the state of Connecticut. So uh, I'm originally from California, I did my undergrad at University of California, Riverside, then I moved to New England, did my PhD at Dartmouth College, then I was a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell, and uh, currently, for the rest of this month, assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, but I'm actually leaving UMass Amherst at the end of this month to join the University of Virginia, so it's uh, a little bit sad to announce that. Okay, Oop, let's see. Great. So my research focuses on uh, biogeochemistry and earth surface processes. Think about rock soils uh, and how they interact with living organisms. I also do regional localized pollution. Think about how does pollutants move in terrestrial and um, the terrestrial water interface. And then I also study ecosystem dynamics. So pressures from invasive species, exotic species, and the loss of native species. So I'm kind of a uh, a Swiss army knife of science. And the linkages across all of these is I study metals. So I study nutrient metals and toxic metals. That's my uh, thread that ties all these themes together. So here in the study, I was very interested in the soil river interface. So for those who aren't familiar, um, you have your stream channel, then you have the river where the water's flowing. You have your hyperreic zone, which you have sediments and waters interacting. Then you have groundwater moving in. Then you have soils and trees and the riparian zone. So what I was very interested in is looking at how these interact. So the erosion of soils, that uh, the soil material becomes sediments. And we can think about bottom sediments either being deposited at the bottom of the stream or being wicked back up and transported. And then you have your suspended transport and just dissolved transported materials. So that's the movement of, of metals either dissolved in water or adhered to the surface of a, uh, a, a, a particle being transported through the water. Now, I'm very interested in this metal pollution aspect. So you have metals that are emitted as a gaseous form or a particulate form depositing on soils and depositing straight into rivers or onto roads and being washed into rivers. And then you also have your pollution where you have runoff or groundwater, contaminated groundwater moving into the stream channel. And then the metals either adhere to particles or become dissolved and transport through the watershed. Let me know if, you, if I go too fast, by the way, uh, Gene, just slow me down. <laughs> so uh, I have three main questions for this project. The first one is that are sediments and riparian soils in the Thames River watershed sources or sinks of nutrients and toxic metals? So if they are a source, that means that we can see the transport actively going through. If they're a sink, we'll either see them accumulated or we won't see them accumulated in the in the sediments and soils. The next question is more about the actual movement. So we're thinking about our river water or suspended sediments moving nutrients and toxic elements in the Thames River watershed. So uh, is water more important as a conduit or is sediments more important as a conduit of toxic metals? So that's actually very important because if it's just dissolved, well, there's not much you can do. But if it's suspended sediments, then you can put in practices to limit sediment transport. And the last one is thinking about current slash historical land uses and how do they relate to metal pollution. As I'll describe, there's a certain characteristics in each of the watersheds that either allows it to be a potential source or a sink of metal pollutants. 
Great. So the reason I chose the Thames River watershed, right? I had actually never heard of it um, before moving down <laughs> to uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, and there's a couple of reasons that I made it really cool to study. So first off, like the Connecticut River watershed is huge. It goes all the way to Canada. So it's too large. And then the Housatonic is already trashed. So we know that there's lots of issues there and lots of money going into changing uh, how things move in the, in the system. So that was kind of uh, washed out. And then the other watersheds that are interesting are too far, like the Penobscot and Maine. It's too far. So the Thames River watershed was a nice, uh, smaller size watershed, but lots of people live there. And that there's some other aspects of this diverse geology and land use that makes it very cool to study. First off, it's a generally a low relief system. So a lot of the watersheds uh, in western Massachusetts and further north into Vermont, New Hampshire are very steep. So they're high energy, very flashy systems. So what's nice with the Thames River watershed is a largely low relief, abundant lakes and marshes. So that's a um, system that's going to be uh, not massively eroded during large storms. Another aspect that's very important is that the historical mills, there's lots of old mills and historical um, municipal and industrial activities in the watershed. So that's an, um, a very interesting, you know, known set of pollutants uh, that can be released to the watershed. Uh, another aspect is that there's lots of dams in the Thames River watershed. So those dams uh, actually make the, the overarching system actually sediment starved because all the sediments are getting built up behind a lot of, a lot of these dams. So that uh, adds another dynamic to the watershed. And, you know, we think that maybe that that's going to actually create more storage and that aqueous and dissolved transport in the river water is going to be more important. And then lots of human development. So you can think of, say, everything from Norwich and then up along the Quinnebog. There's abundant development in the Chituket and the Quinnebog watersheds. And then in some of the watersheds toward the Yantic, there's uh, small farms and uh, like the largest chicken farm in Connecticut is there. So lots of aspects of uh, agricultural sources of metals and urban sources of the metals. So lots of potential metal sources and interesting hydrology and sediment transport that makes it a very interesting system to study. Never get bored here. All right. So in this uh, water, in the Thames River watershed, I actually studied uh, seven sub watersheds. Depends. I, I lumped together two of the smaller ones. So the first watershed that we're looking at is the Bartlett and Exeter watershed is the smallest of the watersheds is 37 kilometers squared. And it has abundant farmland at 10%, uh, pretty forested at 67%, and pretty low development of humans by humans. I also study the French River. So uh, the French River, you know, here you can see the map at the top where these different uh, watersheds or subwatersheds are. French River is 261 uh, kilometers squared, um, no, one of the lowest amounts of forested uh, development and uh, pretty good development in terms of human activity, 11% um, in area. Then the little watershed, um, we're using that as more of a reference, 60% uh, uh, forested, low development, 2%. There is some in, um, historical pollution from industrial activities there. There's also lots of farmland at 16%. Quinnebog, uh, the second, or sorry, the largest watershed at 1,900 kilometers squared, so 1,900 kilometers squared. Um, pretty si good size development at 16, at six percent, but overarching uh, at 116 kilometers squared of human developed land. So it's very developed. Lots of wastewater facilities. So we're expecting this to have some of the most strongest uh, signals of human impacts. And study the Shutucket watershed. Um, Pretty uh, largely forested, uh, only 6% farmland, uh, but also pretty developed in terms of total area of 55 kilometers squared. And then there's three wastewater facilities. So we expect that to be pretty human impacted as well. Study the Still River. The Still River is supposed to be kind of our control system. It's 75% forested, so it has the highest forest amount, lowest farmland and lowest development. So the Still River was really to be our control, what's going on in this watershed, um, just based upon the rocks, very little human impacts. Then we also studied the Yantic River. So the Yantic River uh, subwatershed is 263 kilometers squared, moderately forested, but large farmland at 12%. So the second highest amount of farmland 
and moderately developed at 5%, but uh, 14 kilometers squared. So that's what we studied. Uh, and it's important to note that some of these watersheds are, uh, most of these watersheds are, you know, sub-watersheds of A, the Thames River, but they're also sub-watersheds of each other. So the Bartlett and Exeter Brook sits inside the Yantic River. Then the Still River sits inside of the Chetucket River. And then the Little River, French River, sit inside the Quinnebog River. So they're nested. And that's unfortunately like how it goes with when you're studying these subwatersheds is that if you want to capture certain areas, you oftentimes have to go to smaller subwatersheds to see like the strong impact of, let's like, say, agriculture or, um, or forestation. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, either I lost you and you're taking a nap or hopefully it's good. <laughs> Great. So in this watershed, we collected a couple different types of samples. In the yellow circles are eddy sediment samples. So that's where you know you have a bend or some kind of change in the topography. So then you have um, sediments collecting. These are large pools. So I sampled these eddy uh, bottom sediments in the yellow circles. You can see they're distributed across um, some of the larger watersheds more eff effectively than say the smaller watersheds. Um, then in Oh, I don't have the soils. I collected soils as well. Uh, I have another map that's, I guess I could show later, uh, that has where the soils are collected. I collected soils, riparian soils along, um, along the watersheds as well. And then I have these stars. These stars are where we, we deployed sedi uh, suspended sediment traps and collected river water um, roughly every two to three, uh, two to four weeks, depending on what part of the season it was. So we collected the sediments that were suspended and the actual like uh, water samples. The water samples were filtered, so then we can collect how much our suspended samples uh, in a very quantitative volumetric way. Great. All right, so ah, here it is. Here's where I collected all the riparian soils. So this is the first data set we'll go through. You can see the French river soils are um, situated in the center. That's because lower down, it's either highly developed or um, marshy or um, not very good riparian soils to sample. The Little River we sampled really at the exit. Uh, the Quinnebog, um, mainly in this part and the center, we didn't really sample too much further south. And the Chituckee, we have some upper toward Willimantic. And then we have uh, Chituckett soils uh, collected at the bottom, Yantic mainly sampled at the bottom, and Bartlett Exeter toward the bottom of the watersheds as well. So what did it look like with sampling? We collected using augers. Uh, oftentimes we can go by road, but sometimes we actually had to take canoes down to be able to collect. Uh, we looked for areas that were, um, they weren't marshy, they needed to be up and out of the stream channel, and they needed to have the appearance that they're being controlled by the deposition of the river. So true riparian soils that are influenced by the river and can be eroded into the, into the river. So there we uh, augered and then we collected the soil. So this is just a picture of a, actually a soil pit to look at what the material oftentimes look like. Um, you know, some pretty good organic matter to the surface and then getting down toward redox features where you start hitting the right uh, hyperreic zone and getting reducing conditions. All right, so with the soils and the sediments that I'm going to present later, we take the samples, we digest them in strong acids, and the goal is to solubilize all of the metals, and then we run and analyze them using mass spectrometry. All this was done at UMass Amherst and Department of Geosciences. Great, so here is the first uh, buckshot of data. So there's different colors that represent the different watersheds. No worries if there's something really specific that you want to see. I'm going to send this paper, and this figure is directly from the from the paper, so you'll be able to read it. Um, you can see that we have some differences in organic matter. So SOM stands for soil organic matter. We have some slight differences in pH. They range from about 4 to 5 pH typically. Uh, and then we actually have some differences in nutrients. So the Little River and the Bartlett Ex Exeter Brook River uh, which had the highest amounts of agriculture, had the highest amounts of phosphorus in their riparian soils. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a couple red lines here. The red line and the arsenic at 10 milligrams per kilogram is the Connecticut DEP limits for direct exposure for humans. And then at about 500 milligrams per kilogram lead is where we hit the uh, CET, Connecticut Department of 
uh, DEP limits for uh, lead exposure for humans. You can see that some of the soil samples are above that, uh, pr primarily for our purple Yantic and then our triangular Chetucket. Some of the green Little River as well have a bunch of arsenic in their soils. And then lead was safe for most sites except for the Yantic River, which had an astonishing, you know, 3,000 milligrams per kilogram, 3,000 parts per million lead in the riparian soil. So that's pretty disconcerting. But fortunately, copper, cadmium, and zinc were pretty low. So just to reiterate, soil organic matter and pH varied among the watershed. So we do have some physical chemical properties that are different. Uh, the Little River and the Bartlett Exeter Brooks had high phosphorus, and that corresponds to having more agriculture. Arsenic was elevated in the Yantic, Chetucket, and French rivers. Um, and then the and lead was very high in the Yantic River, but fortunately not high or above what we call um you know, direct human exposure limits for other watersheds. And then overall, copper, cadmium, nickel, and zinc were not elevated. So what we're showing here also, I should note, is the average and the standard error for all of those riparian soils within the watershed that um, we were examining. Any questions on the riparian soils? I, I have one. Um, I'm curious about the lead, whether there might have been uh... Could that have been from tetraethyl lead from gasoline leakage coming in through your study area? Excellent question. So um, the background amount of lead in rocks ranges about from 5, 10 milligrams per kilogram up to uh, 50 to 70 milligrams per kilogram, depending on your sedimentary igneous type uh, or metamorphic type rocks. So the fact that so riparian soils are above the 5070, that is largely from the tetraethyl lead. Yeah, the combustion of leaded gasoline. But these super high amounts at 3000, that's something more localized. So it could be from a potential leak of tetraethyl lead gasoline. I'm going to say unlikely. It's probably something um, more more uh, isolated, some kind of industrial process that dumped a lot of lead in uh, the lower parts of the Antic in the urban area. Great. All right. So next, we're looking at uh, eddy sampling. So these are bottom sediments. So again, the bottom sediments are in these yellow circles. And then we uh, deployed the suspended sediment collector traps only at um, one location per watershed, and we sampled it through time for um, like nine months of a year. All right. So yeah, the bottom sediments just go, you know, basically going down there and using whatever tools, augers we can to, you know, extract a portion of this like pooled material from the bottom of the river in the river channel. Great. So here is what the averages look like. And to show how changes have been going on, fortunately, there's a study by um, Harris et al. 1997. They actually sampled the same rivers, but not in the same locations. And they measured many of the same uh, properties that I measured. So it's nice that we can actually do like a comparison between current stuff and what they saw back in 1997. All right. All right. So the first one is that uh, looking at arsenic, we see that arsenic is much higher in the sediments that we're measuring today compared to the Harris 1997 study. And in fact, um, pretty much at all the watersheds, except for the Still River watershed, which was our um, which was our control study, all the other ones had elevated arsenic above the DEP limits for human exposure. So that's unfortunate. We see that um, Brio, uh, sorry, the Harris study uh, had higher organic matter uh, then our study in the French River, Quinnebog, and Yantic River. Cadmium was much higher in, in their study compared to our study. So that's good. That means cadmium is decreasing through time. Copper uh, was comparable except for the French River, which was much higher. So that's a mixed bag of getting better and being the same. Lead was higher in the French River and in the Quinnebog River compared to um now, so that's good. That means that lead is decreasing in concentrations in these bottom sediments, except for the Yantic River, which was higher still. So that's, um, you know, not good. Uh, but fortunately, copper and uh, lead and cadmium were all below concentrations that are known to be hazardous to humans. Now, the issue is that copper 
can be elevated in bottom sediments and river water uh, and affect more sensitive species like crustaceans. And that's not reflected in this red line. So that's something important to note. Uh, phosphorus wasn't measured by the hair study, so we can't tell if it's higher or lower. Uh, if you read my study, we compare the bottom sediments and sediment transport of phosphorus uh, to other previous studies, and it's right in the middle. It's not super high and it's not super low compared to other watersheds that have been studied. Uh, nickel has decreased in the French River and Quinnebog River compared to 1997, so that's good. But um, uh, unfortunately, the Yantic River still has high nickel. In fact, the nickel is higher than uh, limits for human exposure at about 75 milligrams per kilogram. So that's not good. Uh, and then zinc uh, is a mixed bag. Um, some improvements from, say, the very high amounts of zinc in the French River compared to today. But it is still the French River, the Chautauqua River, and the Yantic River is above uh, the limits for human exposure. So that's not good. Uh, any questions about these bottom sediments? This is all very fascinating. Great. I hope fascinating in a way that there's some positive light and not all doom and gloom. Okay. So suspended sampling, what we did was we basically took two two liter bottles. We drilled some holes for inflow outflow into these uh, polyethylene bottles. We use a ballast and they were suspended from either a rope from a tree or from um, like a wood, a piece of wood, uh, drilled to a tree so they need to be held vertically and they were deployed during the growing season from may to november that's when um, ice uh, was gone from the rivers and uh, high flow conditions in the early spring settled down so we can deploy them and not lose the traps and we collected the sediments roughly every two weeks from these different watersheds. And the idea for the suspended sediments is that the bottom sediments are sitting at the bottom. They need a big storm to move, but suspended sediments are moving under these base conditions. All right. So here we're looking at the suspended sediment metal and uh, other property uh, through time across the different watersheds. So um, you can see sediment mass de deferred across the different rivers for sure. The the Chetucket and the Yantic had the, and the Little River had the highest amounts of sediments being moved throughout the watershed. Um, Bartlett, being the smallest watershed, had the smallest amounts of suspended sediments. And where's our Quinnebog in yellow was actually pretty high as well in terms of total sediment mass being collected through time. Organic matter ranged from about 20 to about 50%. So that's pretty high organic matter content. So it's not a lot of what we call silica classic sediments. So it's mainly, or there's a good portion that's organic matter, not like um, rocks and, and rock fragments. Uh, in terms of suspended sediments, uh, the Bartlett Exeter Brook had just off the charts in terms of phosphorus, very high at 20 milligrams per kilogram compared to the other watersheds. The Little River also had high amounts of agriculture and also had high amounts of, um, of particulate or the suspended sediment phosphorus. So that's pretty indicative, again, showing that agriculture is, you know, there's a strong link between agriculture and high phosphorus in the bottom sediments and riparian soils and now the suspended sediments. Arsenic had, was adhered to particles, so we could see pretty high amounts, again, over the CT uh, Connecticut DEP limits, um, particularly for the French River, the Bartlett Exeter Brook, the Quinnebog River, the Little River, all had arsenic concentrations hovering at or exceeding that CT DEP limit. Copper was good um, in terms of like human health exposure, but the concentrations are still at uh, levels that could potentially affect uh, crustaceans and mollusks, so that's particularly not good. Cadmium was pretty high at, um, in the milligrams per kilogram, but fortunately not at the five milligrams per kilogram, but ideally you want cadmium to be less than one milligram per kilogram, so that's unfortunate. Um, lead, um, you know, anything below 70 milligrams per kilogram lead uh, is you know pretty much background, but we have several of the watersheds that are elevated in particulates and even reaching that uh, you know direct human exposure limits. So that's our Quinnebog and our Chautauqua River, which you know those are large ones that have high amounts of human development. But also the Yantic River as well is pretty pretty elevated. Nickel was good for the most part, except in the French River, 
And then zinc was pretty good in terms of like toxicity. Although I would argue anything above 600 milligrams per kilogram, you have to start worrying about um, how plants are going to respond as zinc can negatively impact plants, depending on how much calcium is present in the water. All right. So yeah, most of the sub watersheds had elevated arsenic in the suspended sediments. Suspended sediment lead was high for the Yantic, Quinnebog, and the Chituckett rivers, which are the large, you know, some of the large main feeders of the, the Thames River. Great. All right. So we also did some water sampling where we reached a dipstick and, you know, collected water um, through time. And these were analyzed again using mass spectrometry to measure at these very low concentrations. Uh, these are going to be in the parts per billion, I believe. All right. So, but before we get to that, it's important to note how did we, you know, how was the water flowing in the 2019 to 2020 year? So fortunately, the USGS has many of these streams gauged or rivers are gauged where you have constant uh, measure of discharge. So that's very nice to be able to illustrate what was the hydrologic year looking like, you know, was it a particularly wet year, or particularly dry year? And 2019, if you don't recall, was actually a, a, a rather dry year. We had a pretty dry summer where even some people's wells were going dry. So, um, you know, our Chituckett and Quinnebog River are the largest. So they have some of the highest discharge rates ranging from about, I would say about five up to like 110 meters cubed per second. You know, and our smaller rivers being the uh, Bartlett Exeter Brook being pretty low and even potentially going dry at parts of the um, hot, dry summer. Uh, and then a little river, you know, is right in, in between next to the Antic in terms of flow. So we have this period, you know, period before the leaves come out, you know, we have high flow conditions and then it got hot and dry during that summer. Uh, so then it got pretty, pretty hot, dry conditions. And then with the leaves going out, they're taking up lots of water and using it for evapotranspiration. So we have decreased discharge in the Thames, across the Thames River. And then it was very dry in August, September, reaching some of the lowest discharge rates. And then we started getting those big storms in later in the year. And then we have the recovery, especially once you lose the leaves and it gets cold again. Cool, any questions about the discharge? I'm not a hydrologist, so I can't, I can't promise I could do much better of a description. <laughs> Nope. Just okay. Wanna, I just want to mention Little River is a source water river. So they they're I'm, the gauge is below their source water intake. And if it became dry, they would turn off that 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 plant and just go to their wells. So that might have influenced some of the flow in Little River. Absolutely. All these flows are um, affected by dams and dam releases and yeah, um you any usage and uptake. So yeah, definitely humans leave a strong impact on this. <laughs> Great. All right. So in the bottom left corner, I have left the discharge. So you can um, double check this, like how that corresponds with the concentrations. So here we're looking at DOC, dissolved organic matter. You can see that it ranged from about one, but mainly about two through about six milligrams per liter. Uh, phosphorus was hanging around 0 0.1 to about, I would say like five micrograms per liter, and then it decreased once you got into winter, which is a very interesting feature for phosphorus compared to other metals. Arsenic, um, yes, it ranged from 0 0.1 up to about one. So starting to exceed what we would consider as potentially hazardous for humans. Uh, copper was low, below um, levels that are you know, for, uh, identified as hazardous. For the most part, cadmium started spiking, but no, for the most part, cadmium is a very insoluble element. So it's typically hanging around the 0 0.01 microgram per liter. So that's um, very, very low. I mean, we're measuring that in the parts per trillion level. So fortunately, cadmium is pretty low for the most part, except for uh, when we had that uh, big flushing event in October. You can see that once the rain starts flowing, then we have this spike in cadmium, copper, arsenic, um, and zinc, really. Uh, nickel was not really changing with discharge rate, so what we would call isostatic. Um, we had high lead during the lowest part of the flow, so uh, in August and September when you had the lowest conditions and you had some of the highest concentrations of, of lead, especially in the, um, particularly in the Chituck and Quinnebog River. Let's see. Yeah, so river arsenic was elevated in most watersheds, especially once you got into the... Um, the later part of the season when you have these big flow events washing elements out. Um, 
lead was uh, high for the large watersheds and even uh, the, our still river, which is actually our control river, which is very interesting. The control river hit the one part per billion level or one uh, microgram per liter level. So that's kind of unfortunate when your control river has a spike in metals. Copper was elevated only under our flow conditions, but remained under um, the Connecticut DEP limit. And cadmium, nickel, and zinc were within the safe limits for for humans, but um, and I would argue for wildlife as well. Great. So um, using that data, we can actually start to put together some interesting budgets. So metals can be either adhered to particles or dissolved. And whenever you collect a water sample, um, you're going to get a little bit of particulates. This is a particularly muddy river here shown um, to, just for example. But metals can be dissolved or adhered to particles. And since we measured the um, amount of metals per unit water and we have discharge rates, we can actually estimate how much water is, excuse me, how much metals are being discharged by water. And since we also collected water samples and we filtered out and we know how much sediment is in the water samples, and then we also have our sediment traps and we, we can get a good grasp on what the sediment looks like, we can then also estimate sediment uh, transport of metals. All right, so it's a big, uh, big feature here, but we're looking at in brown total watershed sediment export and then blue total watershed dissolved export. So if the blue line is bigger than the brown line, that means that water is more important for transport. And if it's the opposite, where brown line is bigger than the blue line, that means sediments is very important for the transport of the element or within the watershed. So for phosphorus, we see that largely. Um, for generally, excuse me, that dissolved transport was most important for phosphorus, but uh, the brown is pretty close by. So showing that, you know, sediment is very important as well. Uh, similar story for copper, where they're almost the same for many of the watersheds, but blue just edges it out. So meaning that dissolved transport is overall more important. Uh, it's also important to note these are logarithmic scales. Sorry, I should apologize. Uh, these are logarithmic scales, so 0 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100, so very big changes. Arsenic dissolved water was most important for most of the watersheds. Nickel dissolved was more, more important for most of the watersheds. Cadmium dissolved was more important as well. Uh, but lead sediment was, the sediment transport was most important for um, lead, except for the small Bartlett Exeter Brook. But the French River, Little River, Quinnebog, Chetucket, Niantic, and Still River, that the movement of sediments is how most lead is moving through the uh, Thames River watershed. Great. Now, um, what was really awesome is that I had that all this data set uh, about the dissolved, the riparian soils, and the sus and suspended sediments and bottom sediments all worked up for a manuscript. And um, I was I went and gave a talk at UConn and talked to Will Wiemann, and he's like, oh, actually, we have some sediment cores that we just collected in the actual estuary of uh, the Thames River, so just past Norwich, but before you get to New London. And it's like, hey, we can actually look at the sediment core and see if we can look at how river water, um, or excuse me, river export has changed through time. So, you know, if you flash back, um, these large industrial areas were, were even larger, right? These mills were active at some point, and that the sediment has slowly been moving through the watershed. And what we can do is use a sediment core to actually go back in time. So this is an example of a, a sediment coring uh, instrument. So the NRCS has been doing a bunch of coastal coring. So this is just an example of the USGS doing it. Um, the, US, the NRCS, I'm pretty sure, does not have such a fancy boat for it. But the sediment cores are nice records where you can actually go back in time and look how sediments have been transporting. So you can use a bunch of different metrics to identify when time was done. Uh, we're in the middle of getting radiogenic data to uh, really solidify. Uh, when these events occurred, but we can actually use different elements to time when things are occurring. So here is our sediment core record. You can see from left, we have arsenic, then cadmium, copper, nickel, lead, 
zinc, and phosphorus. What's nice about lead is that lead gives us a really good estimate about when things were going on. Because um, when the peak of lead used from tetraethyl lead gasoline starts deep diminishing, that's about the successful implementation of the Clean Air Act and Clean Air Act amendments. So that's about the 1980s. And then before the lead use, that's, um, you know, like 1920s. And then before that uh, is, you know, early 1900s. So we can actually put some good approximations on when things were occurring. So here in these red lines that go across these bars is about 1980s, the 1900s, then went back to approximately about the 1800s uh, to then show like what was it looking like. So for arsenic, what's important to note here is that arsenic has been always moving through this uh, watershed. Arsenic has never been zero. And we can largely attribute that to the bedrock. The, there's a lot of sulfide bearing arsenopyrite throughout the watershed. So arsenic has always been moving through this watershed. But more recently, starting in the 1900s, you know, you're using um, arsenic as both a, um, a rodenticide or pesticide and also arsenic use in uh, tanneries. You can see that it increased and has been wavering ever since. Cadmium was being widely emitted during... Um, Industrial activities, it was also part of, um, it was probably in trace amounts of leaded gasoline. Uh, and you can see that once you have the Clean Air Act amendments phasing out, uh, cadmium, zinc, and lead, these are all things that are associated with being with lead. So it's probably part of tetraethyl lead. Uh, those all got phased out all at the same time. And also probably phased out of, say, waste incineration in the area and uh, more stringent uh, Regula regulation on what is in uh, coal. These also contributed to decreases in, in zinc, cadmium, and, and, uh, and lead in the watershed. So you can see that they dropped pretty well, right? We're, we're not back down to background, but we have some, uh, significantly diminished through time the emissions and transport of cadmium, lead, and zinc in the watershed. Copper actually phased out earlier than the Clean Air Act amendments. So that's probably a decrease in the industrial activities occurring in the watershed. You can see some, um, some peaks in the past, but largely we're diminishing back, but we're nowhere near copper background levels. And these are milligrams per kilogram, by the way. Uh, nickel um, has been oscillating. We can see that we're actually not out of peak nickel, but nickel has never been background as, uh, very low at zero as well. Nickel is in the bedrock as well. So again, nickel associates with sulfide, sulfide minerals. So nickel um, has been just throughout the watershed through time. What's unfortunate though, is that phosphorus has not been decreasing through time. You can see that even with the implementation of clean water acts, that phosphorus is still increasing through time. So that's an unfortunate feature that we're seeing. Now, there's a little bit of argument maybe that there's some bioturbation that might be moving phosphorus toward the top and moving it out through the hyperreic zone, but it's still nowhere near background phosphorus levels, um, even with that biological and diffusion and, uh, and advective movements. Cool. Actually, uh, sorry, convective movements. Cool. Any questions about the sediment core? This is like one, uh, one of the most interesting things, in my opinion, of the study. Hi, this is um, Cindy, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the role of iron and pH in the movement back and forth from sediment to water, and I'm more familiar with alkaline. Yeah, um, so I actually do have the iron data. Um, do you want to see it? Sure, yeah. If you're particularly I mean, interested. Yeah, um, I was just curious how that mediates everything because there's so much lead in the or so much iron in the water. Yeah, so the way that iron works is, um, you know, in surface waters that are oxygenated, pH is most important. But um, what's most important for iron is typically its burial and its reduction by microbes to from iron three uh, down to iron two, and that then forms insoluble. Um, iron sulfide or iron, reduced iron mineral so it can then sit um, sit around for a while. Uh, pH, we didn't measure through this, but I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm going to bring it up in a second, but I don't know if iron was particularly variable through time. I'm going to bring up, bring that up right now. Cool. Any other questions while I bring that up? <laughs> 
Uh, just a comment. The, these uh, cores are very typical and, and uh, comparable to many I've seen for Long Island Sound. And nice. uh, part, part of the reason why um, metals in particular fell after the you know late 70s, early 80s was also an economic reason with the mass migration of all the metal finishing industry in Connecticut, which has been famous for, particularly in Western Connecticut over overseas so um that probably helped clean up as much as the clean water act if not more we basically have lost all our metal finishing industry in the state including silver in the quinnipiac river which was once the silver capital of the world wow well that's yeah it's good for the watershed but yeah bad for industry so um here is the iron data so um I, I, can you guys see this excel spreadsheet yeah yeah so you can see it's not variable not too variable through time it's a little bit higher at the surface um but not not too much mm. okay yeah and that's again because iron is just you know within the rocks it weathers out and it gets transported and then once it hits that um higher ph um and fluctuating brine of the um of the actual Thames River, which is tidally influenced, then you have the rapid precipitation of um, iron hydroxide. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Cool. Um, let's see. And yeah, just to uh, one more thing about the sodium. So yeah, sodium is, you know, shows that's pretty strongly um, that there's a lot of tidal influence. And you can see that it peaks toward the surface. And that's really due to that convective movement of water through the sediments and moving it toward the surface. So um, it's not that the Thames is getting br uh, saltier, at least I don't think it is, maybe it is with climate change, but it does look like it's increased at the surface and we could attribute some of that to um, just the upward movement of salt out as it gets compressed. Great, so I guess my last slide is, um, uh, well, last two slides is that um, there are some conclusions that we can draw. First off is that there's elevated arsenic across all the subwatersheds. And like I mentioned, there's some geologic influences, but there's also historical pollution sources, um, particularly in the French River, lots of arsenic in the, in the sediments there and in the riparian soils. And in some of the agricultural areas of the Yantic River and Bartlett Exeter Brook, um, there's lots of uh, impacts there from um, potentially either human sources, historical pollution, or uh, geologic sources. Elevated nickel and lead, um, they were really isolated in this more industrial area. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure I'm just circling Norwich. Uh, that's where a lot of the nickel and lead were really high concentrations in, the, in that little circle that I'm, I'm circled. And our sediment core shows that there is actually been much improvement in terms of total metal export out of the Thames River watershed. Um, that's, that's good. That means that either it's getting buried and can no longer move or that there's no new sources. So I would argue that it's positive, but as you can saw that we're still at hazardous concentrations for both humans and wildlife. So that's something that really should be addressed. And unfortunately I'm moving to Virginia, so I won't be part of getting everybody there to clean up, but, um, I at least hope that this data can really help shed some light on that, uh, the status because there hasn't been really any metal updates since like those EPA studies in the 1990s. Great. So with that, thank you. And I'll take any questions you guys have and I can stop sharing. Hi, this is Cindy again. <laughs> and um, oh. there we are. Um, I was also curious um, why, and my husband here too, about whether why you chose not to test mercury as the metals moving through oh um you can guess why but <laughs> I'd love to hear the, uh well mercury is actually i publish it in a different study it's a whole nother beast in terms of studies yeah. um let's see um so i did study it <laughs> let's okay see. yeah because i I used to analyze both metals and I never learned how to do mercury, but I know it was a pain to analyze. 
Yeah. So um, I studied it. Technique. Yeah. Yeah. I have a direct mercury analyzer, which is like a plug and play tool for studying it. But unfortunately, the water concentrations were very low. Like even my mass spectrometer really struggled. They were like in the single digits parts per trillion. So mm -hmm. that's a good thing that it's so low yeah. that you can't see it. But it's a bad thing because we don't know how low is low. Um, yeah. yeah. So I have another study that uh, oh, okay. is part of a bigger thing that I can include. Oh, but cool. If you want the teaser? Let's see. I'll share. Um, give me one second. Uh, let's see. Great. So, yeah, this is another study I'll send to you. Um, it's actually looking at the Connecticut River, um, the Merrimack River, and the Thames River. So now you get a bigger watershed comparison. So just scrolling down to the figures, uh, again, looking at riparian soils, and this time we looked at upland soils. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the Thames had the highest rip, uh, riparian forest soil mercury concentrations, um, had some of the highest. The Merrimack obviously had a bunch. Uh, yes. So the yellow triangles and circles mean that's low. The orange means that's moderate, 100 up to 300 nanograms per, per gram, that's parts per billion. And over 300 parts per billion, that's, you know, that's higher than tuna fish uh, mercury concentrations. So pretty high in the Thames River um, as well. Yeah. So we'll zoom in. There's the Thames down there. So compared to the Connecticut River, um, yeah, it's a little bit worse, unfortunately. And I think I have another picture. Yeah, so uh, there's no impact versus developed versus what I termed as rural, both for riparian and upland forest soils. And then I think I have some sediment information. Yeah, so again, um, in suspended sediments in the Thames, um, we're looking at somewhere between 200 and 400 nanograms per gram mercury concentrations. And but uh, in terms of total export, the Merrimack and Connecticut River are dumping a lot of, um, well, especially Connecticut, a lot more mercury into the Long Island Sound compared to the Thames River, even though the Thames River has higher concentrations. And that's just because the Connecticut River is a much larger river. Mm. Are you going to send this study too? I can if you want it, and I will because it oh, sounds that, like you want it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that sounds great because. Uh, I'm interested a lot in the Thames and the watershed, that part of the watershed you're talking about, a lot of it drains into what's called Pakatana Cove, just south of Norwich, and then flows out to the Thames. And I'm doing a, some of the things with the lakes up here and some of the brooks, or I'm extending it to brooks over the next year or so. Okay. Um, Gene, should I send it? I'll send them to you. Send them to me, and then I will make sure everybody who's uh, on Perfect. here, or I can actually put it into my meeting notes, and then the links will be there. That'd okay, be great. great. Thank you. Yep. Happy to help out. Because you have a lot of industry right down there at the mouth of the Thames, too. You know, the sub base oh, yes. now. Um, and then there was a lot of, like you showed, concentration up here in Norwich. Pakatana Cove dries out. Most of the dry parts of it dry out during the day with the tide is still tidal influence. So it'd be interesting to see what's in the uh, mud flats there. But the brooks, a lot of the a lot of the brooks in this area just flow into that before it goes out into the Thames. Okay, that makes sense. Do we have any more questions? Thank you very much. This has been a great presentation. So thank you. I think it's been very informative for all. Some of us have been uh, tracking water quality and other issues in the Thames watershed. So I thank you. And uh, I'm going to stop recording.